<clears throat> so I've put together the first um, kind of run through of uh, course material for today. Um, this is pretty much going to cover the things that we will do. Um, so I'll kind of jump through, I'll jump past like the background and stuff like that. I kind of went through that. Um, and I'll jump back up here to the malware analysis thing. But kind of for all of you who are like interested in kind of what are, what's the extent of what we're going to cover this week or I have to kind of get caught up to speed with. Um, <clears throat> really what I will be doing is not, um, not a whole lot of actual malware analysis this week. Um, I want to make sure that everyone has a good grasp of um, uh, using some of the more advanced features in VirtualBox that our team uses a lot for malware analysis. So um, I think the only tools that you'll kind of sort of use that maybe um, straddle that line is uh, uh, Netcad and TCP dump. Uh, some pretty basic tools that some of you may be familiar with already from having to diagnose like, you know, network protocol issues and stuff like that in other classes. Um, so we'll play with those a little bit, get a little bit of familiarity with those. Um, but first, um, I'm going to cover like virtual box networking, some of the different networking options that it offers. Um, but for just all your information, the networking options that we're going to stick with in this class um, are primarily going to be the uh, NAT networking, which is what uh, the image that you all downloaded is set up to use, is that. So uh, basically what that does is uh, VirtualBox doesn't actually use your host system networking for anything. It just pretends to be an application. It makes the um, virtual machine inside um, <clears throat> feel like it's connected to like a NAT router or something like that. So uh, in effect, that means that your virtual machine can communicate, it can create connections to anything that your laptop can create connections to. It can also create connections to anything that is on your laptop as long as you give it the right IP address. Um, so uh, that's very useful from a convenience point of view. Um, not always useful from a malware analysis point of view, especially if, uh, say, exposing your network um, to possible attack from like networks uh, mapping and stuff like that is a concern of yours. Um, so another one that we'll end up doing is host-only networking. Um, there's, um, <clears throat> there's another one that's easy to confuse with this that's called internal networking. So if you use the drop-down, you see that. Um, make sure that you keep in mind that uh, we won't be using internal networking for anything. We'll only be using host-only networking. So host-only networking allows you to have a uh, network interface on your host, so on your laptop, right? A virtual network interface, um, so that your laptop can effectively act like it's plugged in to the same switch as the virtual machines that you have connected to it. Um, so it's really helpful because um, then your virtual machines are still isolated, but you have a very easy interface for communicating back and forth. So for instance, I can um, connect to a web server that's running in my virtual machine with the Firefox instance on my laptop. So another feature that we're going to use um, uh, that some of you may and some of you may not have used is the snapshotting feature in VirtualBox. So VirtualBox snapshotting allows you to uh, basically do a, um, you save like a, like a restore point almost um, in, uh, uh, in your VM. So it'll basically, you know, snapshot the settings, snapshot the memory at the time if it was suspended and snapshot like the disk and everything like that. Um, it's uh, very useful for our cases because um, when I infect a virtual machine with malware and then I want to go and analyze another malware sample in there, I don't want the old infection to kind of still be resident on the system and I also don't want to have to build the system from scratch every single time. So um, shared folders um, is another helpful feature. Um, probably a lot of you use those. In Linux, they're a little bit more, uh, or I should say, they're a little bit less intuitive uh, than they are in Windows. Uh, we will experiment with both of those. Um, and then finally, kind of getting back to NetCat, is uh, we'll do a little bit of network traffic capture. Um, I found this is very useful for the purpose of um, being able to verify that, say, network communication is working um, between systems, or you know, in a nutshell, you configured the network correctly. So. Yeah, that's it. Um, that's what we will cover today. So, without further ado, let's um, set up VirtualBox.
So. And so if you get um, if you get this, you know you probably don't want to update it now. Um, but it, you know they'll probably release a few more virtual box um, you know updates throughout class. So feel free to update. Um, the one thing I will say that yeah, I'll probably update it throughout class. Um, if I run into any problems, I'll try to email everyone to so say that say the updating the such and such version broke something. And then I may ask, I may upload another copy of the uh, of the Kali image or whatever VMs we're using um, to fix that. So, so uh, what we can start off with is just uh, so booting up the Kali image. So um, if you double click on it, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> and probably the first thing that we'll do is. Um, I'll let it boot up and log in. Let me just double check. Yeah. <clears throat> so the first thing that we will do is um, make sure that it's working for everyone. Uh, so one thing I will say also, I probably should have said something about this before, but uh, let me say it now. Um, thing I will say is that um, <clears throat> I set the, the image that I uploaded, I set to have, to use 4 gigs of RAM. Um, definitely feel free to reduce that if you want to. Uh, we'll, today's example, we're going to be using a lot of RAM, so you can honestly reduce that all the way down to like 2 or 1 gigabyte if you want to. Um, the system will run faster if you give it more RAM, but if you see your host Start running slow or something like that. Um, feel free to reduce the amount of memory. So, um, what I'll do is I'm actually going to power it off, and then I'll. Oops. So I'll power it off like this, um, and I'll actually change that on mine. So, like, I might give it like 2040 or something like that. <clears throat> um, the other thing I've got is I've got a snapshot here already set up, so <clears throat> well, that's, that's kind of what you see in the, in the window there. So I'll run it with uh, 2 gigs of RAM. Um, it should work uh, roughly the same. I think I removed enough services so that it can run pretty well in less than that. So, <clears throat> you know, make sure that you can... Um, you know, that you can do it boot in and everything like that. <clears throat> Once you've got it um, loaded up, so like this, um, I found it, um, yeah. So what I recommend, or what we'll do next is um, we can use the, uh, basically the save, um, save or zoom options. It's kind of like hibernate for VMs. Um, if you click on close, if you try to close the window, um, this is also available if you go up here to uh, machine, I think. Yeah, if you go to machine and you do, um, oh, give me a second, I can't remember. I should never do this from, what does it say? I guess, yeah. If you try to close the virtual machine, choose save machine state. Uh, what this will do is um, it'll, effectively be the same thing as doing a hibernate on your laptop or something like that. Um, so the system's still running. Uh, what it does is it saves an image to disk that has the whatever was loaded in memory and everything like that um, saved in place. Um, and once you've done that, we'll kind of give it a little a moment to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> This ends up being a really handy way of doing kind of like a very quick, um, uh, what do we want to call it, like a 
rollback option, right? So um, you don't have to wait for the system to reboot. Um, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a snapshot that is, um, I'll just call it um, state saved, something like that. <clears throat> so what you'll see is that now, um, if you had a snapshot, um, if you had a snapshot already, and let me just double check, I think that, okay, you may not have had a snapshot already, but um, you should have this one here now that says state saved. Um, if you did that um, snapshot with the take button, um, that gives you the ability to basically now mess with the system, and then you can very easily roll back to a already booted up image um, that basically is the uh, safe state. So for instance, if I was to go and run it, <coughs> which, you know, um, now it's running, now it's changing the system from the slave state, um, but it's making sure that the save state option is still here, um, right? So this save state option is still there for me to roll back to. So for instance, if I was to go in here and, I don't know, like change the desktop or something like that to like this, you know, very hard to read one, and then maybe I'd reboot it. You feel free to do any, feel free to make any sort of like destructive changes that you may want to do. Um, um, I will also warn you, this is another thing that I've found happens from time to time. If you get an error like that, um, I do, it just, um, I believe that it is a, um, a just a small uh, glitch in VirtualBox, um, but I found that if I just actually just restart the system, then it works fine and gets through it. Um, the problem is that it may just be a hardware issue with the hardware on my system, and so some of you may also have that. If the VM starts up and it kicks out a dialog box that says it couldn't start the VM, there's a critical error, um, close it try again, um, sometimes it can't get, uh, sometimes there's probably a driver conflict or something. Honestly, it doesn't explain itself, but it works uh, after you try again. So, yeah, so there we go, the desktop still changed, um, you know, <clears throat> so I can, you know, move all of this stuff around, right? Um, so what I'm going to do, um, and this will be the really, uh, uh, this will be the common kind of um, testing pattern that we'll go through, right? So what you'll do is you'll try to close it again, um, but instead of saving the machine state, um, you'll power off the machine, and you'll check this box, which is restore the current snapshot sa uh, state saved. Um, so uh, basically we can do that. And now the effect of this is that it took everything that was in here, and it basically copied it over the current state. Or really, you know, under the hood, what's happening is um, after I need this state saved, it basically allocated space on the disk to keep track of what the system looked like at that moment in time. And then VirtualBox started writing to another file that used that file as the starting point for kind of its uh, differences. So what it's been doing since then has been recording the changes to the save state in a new file that's right here. So VirtualBox, this was a very quick operation because what VirtualBox is doing is just deleting anything that's changed since the previous save state. Um, that's kind of how it's working under the hood. Um, that's, that can be important to know um, if you start working with, um, say, a really complex hierarchy of save states and restore points and all that stuff. So now, if I start it up, <clears throat> it's going to boot up and look exactly like um, the first time before I changed everything. So um, that's a very helpful um, test pattern or um, replay pattern to kind of experiment with and get in your uh, get in your head because that will help you uh, very quickly try to say um, 
diagnose what's going on with malware. A lot of times what we end up running into is um, I have a file that I need to analyze and figure out what it does. Um, means I don't know what it does right off the bat. So now I'm going to have to run it in the system in a bunch of different ways. Um, many ways it may end up breaking the system or it may end up changing the system in some unrecoverable fashion. Um, this is a very quick way of me basically being able to go back and test something, restore, test something, restore, test something, restore, test something, restore. So um, it gives me the ability to say try, say 10 different things within like 20 minutes or something like that uh, without having to wait for a system reboot and then reinstall a bunch of software, things like that. So, <clears throat> all right, so um, that'll cover, you know, that's probably going to be the extent of a lot of the snapshot and the, the snapshot use that we will do. And that's the most important piece to get out of it is that um, once I do that, I can kind of use this mechanism where I basically have, you know, I can save the machine state after I get it started up to a point, which is almost like my test bench, right? Um, I can get it, I can save that, I can snapshot that save state so I don't have to have the computer powered off or the VM powered off to save state. Um, or I should say, I don't have to have the VM powered off in order to snapshot it. I can actually snapshot a saved machine state um, so I don't have to waste time waiting for the reboots. So I'm going to just, uh, so I'm going to restore, you know, shut down, restore, and then I'm going to start it up again. And so the next thing I'm going to do, um, <clears throat> we'll mess with the networking now. So if you, um, you go back to, say, the, the beginning and start up the VM, <clears throat> right now I have, and I can show you in settings, I have um, one network adapter set up and it's attached to uh, NAT, which is basically that virtual um, NAT network or virtual NAT router that VirtualBox has built in. Inside the system as well, you can see that. And then if I was to do, what is this? There we go. <clears throat> you can see that the only adapters that are connect that are configured on here are the uh, loopback and the normal Ethernet device, so single Ethernet device. So this is how all the VMs are pretty much presented to you uh, when you get them. Um, I could have configured uh, I could have configured the Kali VM um, already with a virtual network adapter, but I felt that it was that number one, that's going to be something that we will probably reconfigure a few times uh, throughout the course of the class. And so it's very useful to have all of you kind of run through uh, how to set that up. Um, setting it up in Linux is a little bit different from setting it up in Windows. Um, so to set it up in Linux first, um, actually, it's not entirely sure. I think from your perspective, it'll probably end up um, getting set up roughly the same. But, uh, you know, Doing this is going to be different, right? So you don't have this program in Windows. So demonstrating what is uh, set up correctly is going to be different. <clears throat> so this is one of those changes that, um, in order to make it, you have to um, shut down the system. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to power off the system. Uh, another thing that's important to keep in mind, uh, just kind of just like with your laptop, you don't want to just kill the power on your laptop, you want to shut down using the laptop system. Um, see here, you don't necessarily just want to do this. So don't do this. You know, don't immediately power off the machine unless, uh, unless it's become completely unresponsive and you have another option. Um, instead, use the, in this case, the Cali menu to actually run the shutdown process properly. Um, <clears throat> if this takes too long, so if you're, you find yourself sitting there waiting and the Kali logo is there and it doesn't seem like it's shutting down, you can hit escape. Um, and then when you hit escape, it'll actually it will print out on the screen of the console that'll tell you 
what services it's trying to shut down, um, and it'll actually give you the ability to uh, control C some of those sometimes, or then just respond to prompts. So I've got the thing powered off now. <coughs> and let's see if uh, everyone's here. Oh, thank you. So once it's powered off, go to settings again, and then we'll go down to the like, was it the fifth, the sixth one? And uh, you'll notice that there's four adapters here. Um, most of them are turned off, except for the one that uh, was initially configured. For now, we're going to leave this one as it is, because for the Calum it's going to be very useful for us to be able to um, to pull down other tools. So I'm going to leave that as it is. Um, it's also very useful to all of you to kind of have an experience with the dual home toast um, for some of us. Uh, it's not going to break anything. <clears throat> so, yeah, sorry. <sighs> so what this, um, what this has here uh, is uh, basically given the host-only adapter choice uh, that I mentioned earlier. So you notice it ha basically is a, a minus the second one from the bottom. I don't know if that's always the case. Um, but the one above it or next to it is internal network. Uh, you want to choose the host only adapter, as I said. Um, VBox Net Zero is the name of the virtual adapter. So um, your host will end up having a network device set up. So when I ran IP Adder earlier, right, um, when I ran the IP Adder command earlier, that listed out the network devices that you have. Um, you're going to have one more network device after you uh, configure this. Um, and then the other thing that I a lot of times recommend is if you go into advanced here, um, I usually recommend just kind of re uh, refreshing this number out of habit, the MAC address. Um, <clears throat> I usually try to change these when I export them. Um, it's usually just a good idea to, uh, uh, to just recycle that uh, whenever you import an EVM. Um, that can oftentimes help diagnose like errors and stuff like that. And then finally, um, the other thing that I'm going to ask everyone to do is uh, <clears throat> under Prudence Case Mode here, I'm going to have you allow all. Um, does anyone in here know what that does? Yeah. Yeah. So you can. Um, uh, in a nutshell, it'll give um, it'll give the VMs the ability to see any of the network traffic that's happening over that link. Um, so without changing that, um, and this will come into play later on as we start to um, work with, uh, say, more than one VM, um, you may run into situations where uh, when you have a, your whole system talking to one of the VMs, and you want to monitor traffic with the other VM, you won't be able to see that traffic unless you have promiscuous mode enabled. So this gives you the ability to do that. <clears throat> so I mean, um, a lot of it too, a lot of that is based on that, um, so I'm using VirtualBox here for malware analysis. Um, VirtualBox is used, you know, it's a Oracle product that they're kind of competitor to VMware, right? Um, so they use it for setting up, say, single system clusters and stuff like that. So having that promiscuous mode option as a option within the hypervisor itself allows you to prevent any of the individual VMs from being able to go and sniff network traffic even if someone was to compromise one of the VMs and say break into it and get root on it or something like that, get administrator rights. Um, so that's why that's in place and that's why you have to change it. So I made that modification. So now when I boot this up, <clears throat> it should have an additional network device. And this is why I had us all, um, oops. this is why I had us all um, uh, shut the machine down is number one, you can't make a hardware change like that while it's running. And number two, uh, we want the system to come back up to a clean boot so that it can configure that network uh, interface. <clears throat> so 
So now, um, very easy um, UI way to um, to find out how that worked, or find out if that worked, is to basically click the little network icon in Cali. Now it shows you two network uh, two network devices. It shows you this one down here that it says is disconnected, and then it shows you this one up here. Um, and then also if I click on here, I can see both of them as well. And then finally, um, <clears throat> I can look at them right here. <clears throat> so one of the things that you will notice, or that I, or I notice right off the bat, is that um, this one here uh, got an IP address, and then this one, which I believe is the one I had been using up to now, um, did not get an IP address. <clears throat> and that is probably... Yeah. So now I kind of um, I went in there and I enabled it down here. Or, yeah, I enabled the one down here and I disabled the one up here. Um, that basically caused you can see them both on the screen here. This what Linux does, what Kali Linux is going to do is it's going to boot up and it's going to try to get a network address from either one of the interfaces. Um, what it did was it actually got the network address from the uh, new interface, and then it didn't bother trying the old interface. So I had to manually go in there and turn on the old interface, uh, which is this one. So finally, I believe I should be able to do this. And maybe not. Oh, OK, well, it's one of those things where it worked for me yesterday. It doesn't work today, but that's OK. Um, we can uh, figure out a way around this. So what I'm trying to do is get it to um, attach both uh, network connections because one of the things that um, I won't be able to do is get access to the internet when I'm connected to the uh, to the new interface that I set up. So that new interface, this is kind of showing you um, the new interface that I set up doesn't actually have access to the network, which is kind of what we wanted, right? Host-only adapter is supposed to only have access to um, this little isolated network. And then if I click on this, and it looks like what's going to end up happening is it's going to click that, yeah. So, yeah, it's only going to let me do that. Um, do one or the other. So <clears throat> mine, if I get this 10.2.15 IP address, then that means that I'm on an interface that's connected to the network that's able to get you know, able to get to the internet. And then if I click on this little thing here, so what it is is it lists like the status. It says disconnected, and I'm over here is supposed to allow you to connect to it. Um, it'll actually switch the ones that are connected. And now I can't ping test.com like I was able to earlier. And I've got this 192.168.56.102 IP address. Um, so now I'm kind of running in isolated mode. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring up a terminal window. And I'm going to make this bigger because you probably can't uh, see this. Let me see. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so you can see that. Um, and um, if you were if you're running the Linux system and you happen to run this, you probably won't see all of those. Um, but um, after you've configured the system, you should see something like what I've got highlighted here. So, which is um, I have a VBox Net Zero, which is the same name that you saw in the configuration of VirtualBox. 
Um, so if you run, um, if you're on a Linux system and you do this, um, you should be able to see uh, what I'm seeing. Um, if you give me a moment, I can attempt to at least navigate you to what this will look like on our Windows system. Actually, let me power this off. Because you're probably all using this. <coughs> so, so you know, if I have a bunch of different versions of Windows as well installed as VMs, um, that'll be something else that we'll set up later. Um, <coughs> I'll actually provide you with access to these. These are uh, freely available virtual machines that um, Microsoft releases. Uh, the only caveat is that they do expire 30 days after you import them, which means that during class, you'll have to re-import them, uh, you know, basically every month um, to basically reset that timer. Um, Microsoft says that it's totally fine as far as, like, their licensing goes and everything like that for evaluation and for doing the types of things we're doing. Um, they just mainly make it that way so it's a pain to use them for anything else other than testing like this. So, and so this is uh, coming up. Uh-oh. Yeah, so uh, I can't remember how this works. Know why that's not working well, but I'll just do this. Because in um, Windows 7, it should be roughly the same. But basically, um, so I don't have VirtualBox running inside of any one of these. Um, but um, in Windows, if you wanted to verify that the network interface was created, I was going to show you really quickly uh, where to go to actually verify that. Um, <coughs> takes a lot longer to boot up than some of the other ones. There we go. So in Windows, um, generally what you'll end up doing is you'll have some icon that looks like that. And I think what you end up doing is you open Network and Sharing Center. And then here you'll do change adapter settings or something like that. Um, so if this works, you know, if VirtualBox set up the virtual network interface properly on a Windows machine, what you'll end up having is you'll have another adapter over here that is that uh, VirtualBox adapter. And so you'll be able to see the settings by going in there and clicking on status and details. Um, again, this is running inside of my VM in Windows, but it, if you have a Windows machine that you're running VirtualBox within, as your like normal system on your laptop, um, you basically navigate through the uh, control panel, network and internet, network connections, um, you know, this sequence up here. Um, I think if you just search for interfaces on Windows 10, um, you'll find it as well, and then you use the you should have two network interfaces, or depending on how your system is configured, you should have one more than you did yesterday. Um, and so you open up that one, and then you verify. So um, I'm going to close this really quick. Um, so then um, what you'll be looking for is this. So I'm on a Linux system. Uh, so I'm just using the normal Linux tools. Um, my VBox Net Adapter has this IP address configured for it. And then the network adapter inside of the Kali system should have that, uh, has a similar thing. So what you'll want to look for 
is your Kali system to basically have a network address that is on the same that is in the same network subnet as um, as your um, your host system. And so then um, you can even ping, right? So first I'm going to try to ping the IP address that my laptop was given on that little network, right? So we'll try that. Um, I always find that's a very good test because driver problems do happen and you may find yourself assuming that the problem is because you've misconfigured your VM only to find out that silently behind the scenes um, the Windows or Linux driver for VirtualBox virtual networking died for some reason and you need to reload the driver or you know, shut down and start up the interface or just reboot your computer in order to fix that problem. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very quick way to diagnose that that's not the case um, by pinging the IP address that was given to the network interface. So I did that. That looks like it's working all right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside of my Kali, v Kali VM, get the IP address here, verify that the first three sections of the IP address are matching the first three sections of my laptop's IP address on that virtual network, uh, NetBot virtual networking adapter. Um, once I've verified that, what I'll do is I'll ping that IP address on my Kali machine to verify that I'm actually able to see the traffic, right? So now I'm able to talk to the two machines over that network. Um, the other thing that's useful here, and the reason why I'm trying it from my laptop, is because I want to verify that um, basically I have the ability to connect directly into the VM. So using the NAT network, the original configuration that was shipped with it, I actually don't have that ability. I don't have the ability for my laptop to actually talk to the system over a network layer. Um, I only have the ability to interact with it through the keyboard and through the mouse. So this is me opening up one more avenue to communicate with that system. <clears throat> so now that I've done that, um, what we can do is we can try uh, one more example, uh, which would be using Netcat. So <clears throat> Netcat's uh, one of my favorite tools um, for doing very simple like network experiments and stuff like that. Um, you should have uh, Netcat installed. Um, the, it'll be installed as NC. Um, it'll also be installed as Netcat. Um, one's an alias for the other. Um, there may or may not be aliases to this NC.traditional. Um, so to be safe, um, because there are multiple versions of Netcat, the one we're going to use is the one that is installed on your system so as Netcat traditional. So it's the Netcat version that comes from the person who made the NMAP toolset. Um, some person named uh, who goes by the alias Hobbit. So um, <clears throat> the reason um, I want to use this version is primarily because um, it has this feature here. Um, this is dangerous, um, which is you know, which is fine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, first, what I'm going to do. Um, Basically, what this gives you the ability to do, it has some features in here that have, that allow you to uh, run commands based upon what's passed back and forth over the network. Um, what I'm going to do first, though, is I'm going to run Netcat um, in Kali. I want to have it listen for incoming connections because I want to create a connection from my host laptop to the internal system. And um, the reason why we're doing this is it's a very good, it's, it's a very good um, design pattern for a test bench uh, once you have a piece of malware that's running a uh, backdoor on a system, and that backdoor is supposed to give either a uh, command shell or a um, uh, command options or command arguments, you know, command line interface of some sort. Um, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to run it in listen mode, which is right here. So listen mode for inbound connects. Um, when I do this, I need to give it a local port number. So I'll give it a port number. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give it a really absurdly high port number. So I'll give it the port number that's basically the, le the number four or five times. So 44,444. <clears throat> 
And so now that's listening on the system. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing here on my own system. And you can use NC or you can use NC dash dot traditional. I've kind of gotten myself in the habit of doing that and tabbing. Um, it's basically the same program. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect it to, I'm going to tell it um, to connect to the IP address and port that are on the remote system, the one that I'm listening on, right? So dot 102 was configured to be the um, interface here. I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, I can. Right. So dot 102 is right here. That's Kelly's interface. That's where I got that number from. So if uh, your number may be different, so make sure that you're not copying verbatim what I'm doing, but you're doing a lookup on your own systems. Um, <clears throat> does it seem to be you need to uh, So you should have that running inside the system. <clears throat> and then this is me connecting to that one. Um, if I remember correctly, with just the way your options, I don't get any um, I don't get any notification that I've connected. Um, so if some of you are familiar with using the Telenet tool to do the same type of thing, um, a lot of times it'll tell you when it's connected and tell you when it hasn't connected yet. Um, this doesn't have that feature, um, <clears throat> so the way that I'm going to try and figure out is I can run a test to basically send the word test over the wire and see if it shows up on the other side. So basically I'm talking to myself here, right? So this is actually a nice, uh, nice review because I can actually see the output coming on the other system. <clears throat> so then, uh, when I run it, hit Control C to close that, you see that it'll also terminate the client connection. So like a normal network service, right? So if um, you know. <clears throat> if you were connected by FTP to FTP server or something like that, someone turned the power off um, or someone shut it down or whatever, um, then eventually your connection is going to be severed and the command will tell you that. Right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, doing network traffic analysis, we'll figure all that out, uh, or we'll be able to figure out how to identify when that has happened on the line. Um, but then for this, we're going to do one more thing. <clears throat> which is we'll run a program to exec after connect. And in this case, I'm going to do something um, that would normally be dangerous to do on your own system connected to the UC network because um, anyone would be able to connect to your system. But in this environment, again, we're running this in a safe, isolated network. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run <coughs> this when I run that cat. Um, and so then I'll just reconnect again. And I don't get any confirmation that it's um you know I don't get any confirmation that anything's happened, right? Um, but if I try to do it like this, I get the output of running the ID command. <clears throat> I don't get any um, output on this side. Um, <clears throat> so I can basically have a shell interface. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'll say is that um, uh, Bash isn't providing the little like Bash prompts that you're probably typically familiar with seeing, um, and that's because um, from Bash's perspective, uh, it thinks it's just running a script. And that these things are being fed, these commands are being fed into it almost like it was a script. And so, just when you run a bash script off of your computer, um, or like in Windows, if you run a batch script or a PowerShell script, um, 
It doesn't typically print the little prompt every single time that there's a command in one of the lines of the scripts um, because that would be noisy. So they actually disable the feature to display that all together. Uh, the same is happening here. Um, but you know, in a little short um, you know bit here, a uh, little short exercise here, um, we basically set up uh, one of the more rudimentary um, remote access shells um, pa patterns that people use. So, um, you know, if I was an adversary and I had managed to compromise this machine, a very simple um, approach to give myself, um, say, more permanent remote access, uh, maybe use a command like this. Um, and so there's a uh, <clears throat> one more thing that I think I'd do is uh, this one. Um, actually, let me just do this. So if I disconnect, it's still connected here. And I'm trying to remember what I need to do to stay connected. It might be this. No, I can't remember, but, uh, yeah, anyway, what I can do is I can always do this. Right? And so I can maybe run something like this in the background after I've gotten into a system. And then I can get the T that <clears throat> that's always available, even if the system administrator beats me off. So this is kind of a very simple uh, demonstration of how some of the attack commands might work, right? Um, but also a very easy way to help you diagnose, have I got this network connected correctly and everything like that. Um, so, let me see. Like one minute left. Um, so then finally, the other thing that you could do, possibly, is you could do TCP dump. So again, you want to do this. Yeah. So TCP dump is a way of, say, monitoring traffic. So what you may end up wanting to do if you're trying to interact with a piece of malware on the system is remember, say, the, uh, the command that I have above, um, which will record the network traffic that's going across that particular interface. Um, and then I'll write it out to this little dump file. So I'm going to write it out to the dump file right now. see that there are a bunch of packets captured and received by the filter and everything like that. So there's data in the file. Um, class is already over, so I'm not going to dive into analyzing that file. Uh, what I will do is I'll make the file available to all of you. Um, and so, um, so we'll have it for future exercise. All right. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.